I love the, uh, the refrain of that song. The strength to follow your commands could never come from me. And as we're going to see today, the strength to follow what God commands, it's true, it could not come from you. I want us to, we're going to be dropping into Jesus' Sermon on the Mount again, continuing in the next verse. The next verse after where we left off last time we were here is Matthew 5, 27. But I want to remind you that Jesus, when he was preaching this, it's not like he took a break. There were no section breaks. There weren't paragraph breaks. He was just preaching. So this verse comes immediately after the verses before that come immediately after the verses before. So let's remember where we have been. Do you remember how Jesus began his sermon? I think we were talking about this more than half a year ago with the Beatitudes, the statements of who is truly blessed. Do you remember last time when we were talking about murder and anger? It hearkened back, it reminded us of Jesus' statement, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Do you remember Jesus' command, or Jesus' statement, you've heard it said, don't murder? And he reminded that, he was teaching that the, the same heart that would murder is an angry heart. So don't focus on the external Okay, if I don't murder, I'm okay. But Jesus was getting to the heart, the heart of anger. And he actually said, don't just not be angry, but be a peacemaker. Because it's the peacemakers who are, the, who are going to be called sons of God. What does that mean? If you are going to be a Christian, Christians are God's sons. Everybody who's a Christian was, was adopted made a child of God, and Christians are described as peacemakers. And in the verse right before that, Matthew 5, 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. All Christians are going to see God. So what Jesus is saying is that Christians are pure in heart. God demands purity from the heart. Not just external purity. God sees your heart and he demands purity from the heart. And that is going to be the overarching theme of today's lesson. Sin occurs in the heart. God demands purity from the heart. So now fast forward and we have this whole section that Jesus is, is preaching right now. It started in 520. Open up your Bibles and look at Matthew 5, verse 20. I have it for you on the screen. It's the first slide. It's the, the first verse of this next slide. We spent a lot of time on it before we talked about murder and anger. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And that might not mean much to you unless you remember who the scribes and Pharisees were. These were the teachers of Israel. And they made certain that everybody knew, especially the Pharisees, that everybody knew that they were the most righteous, the most godly people out there. So imagine the hearers saying, unless your righteousness is more than the most righteous person that you know, the most godly looking person you know, you'll never enter the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, of heaven. And then Jesus goes from that and he, he goes on. And if you look at this section, you'll see verse 21. Look at verse 21, 27. 31, 33, 38, 43. I know I, I went through that fast, but you're going to see 
Jesus says over and over again, he says the same phrase, something like you have heard it said. Do you see that? Verse 21, you've heard it said by those of old, do not murder. And then look at 27, verse 27 of Matthew chapter 5. He says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. And then verse 31, it was also said, and he says that over and over and over again. And do you know who Jesus is quoting? Do you have any guesses? Think about it. Who is Jesus quoting? It sounds like he might be quoting the Old Testament there. You've heard it said, do not murder. That, that is actually in the Old Testament. That's one of the, the Ten Commandments. That's the Sixth Commandment. But do you remember what it said? Do not murder or you'll be liable to judgment. He's actually not quoting. He's not saying, oh, you've heard it said in the Old Testament, but let me correct it. Jesus is saying, you've heard it said by the scribes and Pharisees, by your teachers. You've heard it said. And then he says something. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. And then he says all these other things. And then Jesus says, but I say to you, Jesus is not correcting or the Old Testament. Jesus is correcting the scribes and Pharisees because they had it all wrong. The scribes and Pharisees, and listen, listen up here, the scribes and Pharisees thought that they could keep God's law well enough to be right before him. And when it was obvious that they couldn't quite keep it, they sort of changed the rules. They focused on something that made them feel pretty good about themselves. And then they told everyone, this is the rule and watch us keep it. You should feel pretty good about us too. They taught a version of God's perfect law that they thought they could keep. And then as long as they kept that version of God's law, they thought they would be righteous. But Jesus gave his and God's view of their external law keeping while their hearts were off limits. So I want you, you to think about this. Jesus saw right through them. And Jesus sees right through you. These scribes and Pharisees, they said, don't murder. And they felt pretty good about themselves because they weren't murderers. Or at least not directly, right? They murdered Jesus, but they didn't even do it. They had their hands off and let the, let the Romans do it. And they said, don't commit adultery. And then they set some, some rule for adultery that didn't match the Bible. And they came out and they came out with all these external rules and they focused on externals. Do you know what I mean by externals? Externals is like what you do that people can see, right? When somebody looks at you at church, or your parents look at you, all that they can see is the external. And you might say, I need to keep these external rules and I'll feel pretty good about myself. And God sees right through you, just like he saw right through the scribes and Pharisees. God can see down into the deepest you. So let's look and see what Jesus' assessment of the scribes and Pharisees was. Read this. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Who knows what a hypocrite is? Mary? It's someone who says, like, um, like I wouldn't, like, don't do this. If someone, some random person does something they don't like, and then they do it. Then they do it themselves, yeah. So they, they say one thing and do another. Yep. So they, you are like, and look at what he says they're like. They're like whitewashed tombs. So in this day, a tomb, it wasn't like a, we, we bury our people underground and put a headstone over it. They tended to put their people in caves or in a, inside a rock. And what's inside that tomb? A dead, rotting carcass of a person. There's, it's gross. But they make the outside look nice. It's a pretty tomb. We, we do this sometimes with our tombs. He says it's a whitewashed tomb. It's nice and clean on the outside. But what's inside? He says outwardly it appears beautiful. Tombs can do that. But what was inside of them? 
full of dead men's bones in all uncleanness. Jesus saw right through it. The people looked and then the Pharisees said, hey, look at us. We're so righteous. We keep all of God's rules and we keep it better than you. And they taught God's rules. But they taught their version of it in a way that focused on the externals and missed the heart. And Jesus says, you've heard it said. Look at the external. But I say to you, and he repeatedly gets to the heart of the issue. And that's what we're going to get to. See, Jesus said, you Pharisees, on the outside, you look clean, but inside you're full of dead men's bones. You outwardly appear righteous to others. But you know what? What you look like to me, what you look like to your discussion group leader, what you look like to your friends, and what you look like to your parents does not matter. If it doesn't match what's going on inside. He says, because within you, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Do you remember what, last, what we learned a few weeks ago? The Pharisees and scribes would say, don't murder, but they were content to hate in their heart. And Jesus got to the heart of the issue. If you have hatred in your heart for your brother, if you say you fool, that's on the inside. Nobody can see those inside thoughts but God and you're still liable to judgment. And so today, Jesus goes one step further. He continues to drill down on the heart. So let me ask you, is your heart off limits? Is your heart off limits? Because what you're going to hear today, and what you're going to hear for the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, is really, really hard. It's actually impossible without God. Without God changing you from the heart. The other thing that this will do is it will reveal that you are far more sinful, that I am far more sinful than you or I might think if we look at the outside only. So prepare yourself, because this is this is going to reveal where your hope is. And the great thing about that is if you can identify where your hope is, if it's a misplaced hope, you can confess that, repent. And we, we say it all the time. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to what? Forgive them, to cleanse them. Okay, so... We're going to now look at what Jesus says in these verses. So look down at Matthew 5, 27. Matthew 5, 27. And what you're going to see here is that self-justifying man focuses on external behavior. Self-justifying man focuses on external behavior. I'll explain what I mean in a second. Verse 27, Jesus said, You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And the teachers of the law used this statement to prove their righteousness. He said, I don't commit adultery. Now, they redefined adultery completely. They said, I don't commit adultery, therefore I'm okay before, before God. Because the seventh commandment of the law, God said, you shall not commit adultery. So what do I mean by self-justifying man? Do you guys know what justification is? Justification, when you hear that word justify, think righteous. Justify is to be declared righteous. Okay, so, so just, if you're just and you're right. If you're just and righteous, same word, okay? So if you're self-justifying, what does that mean? What happened to the font? So self-justifying means you're saying, I have righteousness in myself. Do you remember how this section started? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter heaven. 
So the, the scribes and Pharisees are saying, hey, I don't murder. I don't commit adultery. Therefore, I'm right before God. And adultery is a horrific evil. Do you guys know what adultery is? Some probably do. Some might not. Uh, adultery at, at the core, it's, it's defined as doing with somebody else what is only appropriate to do with your spouse. So that which God reserved for marriage God, you remember what Eric said during the Q&A last week. In, in this world, you are relate, to relate to people, especially people of the opposite sex, in one of two ways. Either they're your wife or your husband, or they're not. In the church, they're either your wife or your husband, or they're your brother and sister in Christ. And to commit adultery is to do with another person that which would only be appropriate to do with your spouse. Adultery is a horrific evil. And adulterers, the Bible is clear, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Adultery is also just a foolish path to misery. When you are pursuing that, this world will tell you true joy is to be found. True, true joy is to be found in having that which God reserved for marriage on your own terms. Right? We talked about this a little bit with crushes, with dating, and, and what I said probably sounded absolutely ridiculous to everybody in the world. If you're living for this world, because the world promises you there will be joy in grabbing for yourself pleasure on your own terms. And God says, no, there's actually going to be more joy for pursuing pleasure the way that I created it to be enjoyed. And when you go outside of God's plan and you pursue pleasure on your terms in a way that God forbade, in a way that God said no, you will only find misery. And ultimately, that is a path to judgment and hell, but that's going to be for next week in the next verses. But what we see here, I, I want you to, to see that this point, Jesus was not disagreeing with the statement, you shall not commit adultery. You shouldn't. You must not. But you shouldn't feel comfortable if you're like, well, I'm not doing this. And you see, this is what the Pharisees did. They set up a mark. And you might be doing this in your own heart, in your own life, whether it's in the realm of, of sex or the realm of relations to others or in any other thing you might do. I did this when I was your age. Actually, this was the mark of my non-Christian life. I gave myself standards of righteousness. And I thought, if I don't exceed that mark, I'm okay. And you might do this in your own mind, in dating. Okay, we can do this, but not that. We can do this, but not that. But if we go, you know, and, and, and you have your standard and somebody else might have your standard. Now, what are you focusing on? Externals. Externals do matter. Because if you fail on the externals, it, it, it will bring misery. And worse than that, it's, it's actual disobedience. The Bible is very clear. Do not commit adultery. But the Bible is also clear. Do not commit adultery in your heart. Even in the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 17, the Tenth Commandment, says do not covet in your heart. What's coveting? Who, who knows what coveting is? Go for it. Hmm? Exactly. Wanting something that's not yours. Wanting something that's somebody else's. And, and at the heart of it, what does he say? He doesn't... Now you see, even in the Ten Commandments, God is getting at a heart level. Guys, Proverbs 6.25. If this is a struggle for you, and it, if it's not today, it will be at some point, prep yourself by reading what true wisdom is. Proverbs 6.25, this whole section 
says, do not desire her beauty, the wife of somebody else or a seductive woman. Do not desire her beauty in your heart. Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes because that is a path to adultery, a path to death. But even there, the, the proverb, true wisdom, is focusing on the heart. Be careful of your heart. Righteous Job said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. How could I gaze at a virgin? In the, the heart of a godly believer, Psalm 19, 14 says, Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in your sight, O God. The, the Bible is always... Old Testament on, God's word from the very beginning has looked into the heart. And here Jesus takes this command that the, the Pharisees thought justified them. I don't commit adultery, at least not according to my definition. And he said, but I say to you, right? Self-justifying man focuses on external behavior. But man justifying God focuses on the heart. What did Jesus say? But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, look down at what it says, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The adultery that God cares about, the God who sees into your heart, is not the external act only. If you look with lustful intent, if you commit sin in the heart, you've already sinned. It says if you look with lustful intent, it doesn't say that will lead to adultery, although it might. What does it say? You have already committed adultery adultery in your heart. So what does it say? It says, if you look, everyone who looks, this is not just, okay, if I'm walking down the road, right? Our world around us has all kinds of things that want to grab your attention and grab your soul, right? Grab, grab the attention of your deepest desires. Billboards, they're trying to sell to you. They're trying to get your attention. They, they, they get the first look. The first look isn't the sin. What do you do after that? You keep on looking with an intent, right? If, if, you, if you know, guys, you, you might know this. There's certain apps. Maybe there's a certain road. Maybe there's a certain person at school. Girls, this might apply to you as well. Where you know in this setting there's going to be an opportunity for me to have sinful intent. You probably know where some of those things are. Some of them might catch you by surprise. Think about King David. You know the story of David and Bathsheba. He's on the roof. She's on the roof. He couldn't help but notice. <laughs> All right, there's sometimes you're just like, well, I saw that. I'm not going to look. Can I guard my heart? Don't let the intent of my heart lead to sinfulness. But David kept looking. David looked and he pondered. And at that moment, that led to all kinds of sin, right? What kinds of sin did that, did that keep looking lead to? Led to adultery, led to murder, led to all kinds of devastation in his family, in his kingdom. And God was gracious to forgive. But with that look of lustful intent, David had already committed adultery with her in his heart. When you look and keep looking, adultery. That's sobering. 
Guys, that, that, that means that even if nobody knows but you, girls, if you desire, keep on desiring that which is off limits for you now because you don't have a spouse or even married people, if you look and keep looking, if you desire anything that should be reserved for a spousal-only relationship, somebody who's not your spouse, Adultery now. It won't only lead to adultery, although unchecked it will. It's adultery in your heart. Consider how this should inform your, the question last week. Remember we asked about crushes? Uh, what is a crush but desire? Right, and, and so we do things. So girls like to put posters in their room of the guys they have the crush on or a picture in their phone. Or guys, you put a, it's normal in the world to put things on walls, on your phone. Maybe only in your mind. That you think are, well, everybody does it. And what does Jesus say? Adultery in your heart. The point is, don't feel good because you've met some outward standard of righteousness by not doing something prohibited while you're sinning in your heart. Actual sin of adultery not only begins in the heart, but it happens in the heart. You and I must come to grips with that reality. Why did I say man justifying God focuses on the heart? Because this sounds like, if, if you only look at this and you say, Unless your, your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes of Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of, of heaven. And you know an adulterer cannot enter the kingdom. Paul is clear. The Bible is clear. And if you hear this and you say, if you look at a woman with lustful intent, and then the application, if you have sinful intent in your heart, you've already done the deed. Not one person in this room, not one person in the world could stand. Think about that. And God is not overreacting. When Jesus died on the cross, every lustful look from everybody who believed was poured out on him. And if that was your only sin, if that was my only sin one time, it would be right for God to pour out his wrath on me for eternity, for rejecting him, his good plan, pursuing sin. Self-justification looks at my life and says, look what I do and look what I don't do. I feel pretty good about myself. I'm sure God will too. But inwardly, you're full of dead men's bones, right? You clean up the outside, but you're content to look and keep looking. You're content to desire and keep desiring. But God justifies man. When God justifies, what does he do? He declares righteous. Self-justification says, oh, I believe there's righteousness in me. When God justifies, he forgives all your sins and then declares you to be righteous. He takes Jesus's sin or Jesus's righteousness and places it on you, takes your sin, places it on Jesus. And he says, righteous. And it's not fake. It's real. It's you are clothed in his righteousness and then he changes you, not on the outside merely, right? He doesn't just whitewash your tomb while you have dead men's bones in you inside. Paul says, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, your hearts were wicked. You've become obedient from the heart. This is what it means to be born again, right? These are the language. You're, you're born again. You were made a new creation. You were transferred from the domain of darkness to the kingdom of his beloved son. That's why it says God is faithful and just to forgive and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He changes you from the heart, sanctifies you. And one day, we heard about this this morning from Smed, we will be unable to sin. All things will be made new. So with this correct view of what it means to be justified, 
When you hear this, you ought not say merely, oh, I need to try harder. Oh, trust me, there will need to be some dramatic interventions in your life. That's for next week. But your, your first response is, oh, no, I need a Savior. By this, think about it, by this standard, none of us can stand. None of us should feel good about yourself. Every one of you, especially me, I'm sitting up here, I'm preaching this, and I'm saying, oh, I've sinned from my heart. I need a Savior. I am so, so thankful because my righteousness could never measure up. And then not only do I need a Savior, but now when I say I want to walk in a manner worthy of that calling, I want to focus on my heart just like God did must not focus on externals like a self-justifying hypocrite. I want to focus on my heart, repent from my heart, be clean from my heart. So what are the implications of this on your behavior? What about like what movies you watch? What's on the screen? It, 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 that really matters. If, if a lustful look Is adultery? What about like the, the books you read, romance novels, the kinds of movies? Maybe not only the look, but what does it do to your heart? What do you desire? What are you awakening before it's time? Posters on the wall, websites visited, social media, what you follow, if you use it, interacting with and thinking about the other the other sex? What about flirting? What are you trying to entice? What about the way you dress? Modesty? Are you, are you looking out for the other? What about thinking about dating? If, if a lustful look is adultery, what's going on at the heart level? God isn't, isn't worried about it. He's very worried about the externals. But, but just as much so, it's the internals. Guys, this isn't how close can you get to sin and still be okay. You flee it from the heart. And then, uh, this is actually so much better because now when two people have been doing that, do get married. There's a, there's a sweet waiting. And there is a sweet ability to give glory to God saying, God, you have kept us pure for each other. We've waited. Now this is right. What about things unrelated to lust? What about obedience from the parents? If you outwardly obey, but you're grumbling on the inside, I think this applies, right? That's disobedience from the heart. What about, I'm giving because I have to, but I'm grumbling. That's selfishness from the heart. Not murdering while harboring anger. That's murder in the heart. What about going to church, sitting in the seats during student ministries and taking notes, looking really good, giving the right answer, while there's no desire to please God in your heart? God sees right through it. That's sin in the heart. This your heart may be screaming against what you're hearing, saying, that's too dramatic, that's too extreme. How is that going to be any fun? Maybe you're condemned. Maybe you have already, maybe you're walking in, in habits of, of contentment with internal sin. Maybe even external. Confess that to the Lord. I'm, this is not, I'm just telling you what Jesus said. This isn't, this isn't just Jacob's opinion. I, I'm just opening up the text and saying, the one who made you, the one by whose standard you and I will be judged, the Lord of all, the King of Kings, he's the one who said this. He's the one who said the heart matters. And so if, if there's sin in your heart, especially externally, Oh, confess and, and, and repent. Uh, 
there is joy in that. There is cleansing in that. There is forgiveness in that. Your sin, while you have another breath, you don't know when your breaths are going to stop. While you have another breath, there is hope for cleansing from the heart. I want to end with 1 Corinthians 6, 9. That's at the bottom of your page. Paul says clearly, the Bible is clear, adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolater, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. You should not feel good about that list. Every single one of us, those stick. If not every single one, at least most of them. And if you're thinking about a heart level, we stand condemned. We will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says, and such were some of you. Everybody in the church. The church are not people who didn't fit these categories. They're people who used to fit these categories. So if you look at yourself and you say, I'm an adulterer. Praise God that you realize that. Because if you say, oh, no, I'm not because I haven't done such and such a sin, or I feel good enough about myself, or I don't need to confess that, hopeless. Because you are, before God, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But if you say, oh God, I am an adulterer, and I didn't know it till now, or I wasn't convicted of that until now, and I'm like, I need to enter the kingdom of God. I need you forever. I, God, I, I can't deal with this sin. I'm, I'm, I am an adulterer. I am a sinner. And you cry out and say, I need a savior. Now this next part will apply to you. It says, and such were some of you. But what happens at salvation? You were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. You're no longer standing on your own righteousness, but with Christ's. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And all who are saved, now you're going to walk in it. You're going to confess these sins from the heart. You're going to pursue obedience from the heart. So what I want to do is go to discussion groups. Discuss this. What Think in, in your heart. It, judge your behavior. or your, As you think about your life, say, have I been focused on the externals only or concerned about the heart. What does God see when he looks at my heart?